Uh, welcome again, everyone, to another Future Day. Um, but, well, actually, before we do that, let's see a show of hands. Who thinks that the world is getting better? <laughs> Who thinks that it's getting worse? <laughs> Who thinks that it's probably getting a little bit better in some ways and a little bit worse in some ways? <laughs> the world's getting awesome, but there are some things that we have to work out. Um, so, uh, for those of you who don't know much about me, uh, I am the leader of the Science Party, uh, which was originally called the Future Party. And uh, I decided to create that party around the idea of advancing technology and bringing the future more quickly forward. Um, we changed our name to the Science Party because I think that people didn't realise what we meant by future party, there could be lots of different futures, conservative futures, uh, Christian futures, fascist futures, so I think we confused a few people. Trump, uh, Trump, but, Trump futures. Mm -hmm. Trump futures, <laughs> lots of making things great in arbitrary ways. Um, so, I also am a CEO of a startup called uh, TapU, um, so I'm really into you know, being exponential. Um, so, about today's talk, it's about uh, exponential technology and ethics. What are we going to do when things change? So, just to introduce <laughs> this talk, um, when I'm talking about ethics, I'm talking about what happens to sentient beings. So, if you think that forests should just exist because they should just exist, it doesn't matter whether there's an animal or a human to enjoy it, or you think that this thing should stay barren, um, it might not vibe with you. Uh, so we're, we're worried about the moral impact of what we're doing in this talk. What I'm talking about is not an endorsement. So uh, for future journalists who look at this, when I talk about this, <laughs> I talk about it in context, why, uh, why this might happen, not uh, that I actually want it to happen. And uh, this thing is about things that are either likely to happen uh, or could happen in our imaginable future. I'm not going to answer many uh, questions, I'm just going to ask lots of them actually because I don't think that many people have an answer. Um, and the inspiration for the, the topic of this talk was something that I saw, came up in the news on my birthday actually, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, not this, you got some pig cells, you got some human cells, human pig chimera. That happened, uh, well, it was, the research was done last year, but it's this, uh, and it's pretty uh, exciting, but also a little bit scary. So, it was uh, January 2017 by the Salk Institute in California. Uh, so what they did is they put human cells and pig cells together into a single embryo and it developed. And that was really cool because you could create human-like organs in a pig. They let the uh, embryos develop until three to four weeks. And uh, what they intend to do with that in the short term is to use it to test drugs on those organs because you've got a complete set of cells with the correct DNA uh, in that organism. But further from that, uh, the end goal is to grow organs. Now, there's a little bit of an ethical issue that comes in here. So, who are we to say that uh, we should be able to just grow pigs and kill them so that we can keep humans alive? Well, actually, we kind of do that already. Um, we have farms and we kill pigs and we eat them and it keeps some people alive for a, a short period. Um, so, it is morally problematic these farms are not very good. You can imagine that the ones that they're growing your personal organs in will be quite a bit nicer than your average meat farm, but you can't be guaranteed about that. Um, the other interesting ethical question is where does the human start and the animal end? Cave toilets. Um, <laughs> you, when you start putting cells into an organism like that, or when you start mixing up human and, and animal, um, the morality that we have, which says that we're allowed to treat animals in certain ways and uh, humans in others, starts to break down. So, 
Uh, the reason why this is interesting is because we're actually already doing that. So we've got uh, something which is much closer. We take mouse genes, we take human genes, and we get humanized mice. And we've been using that for a very long time uh, to do our research. So <laughs> it's, it's, very, um, it's very standard procedure to use these mice. They're very useful because it allows us to do some uh, safety and some efficacy tests on mice before we do them on humans. Because it'd be very bad to lose you know, a whole batch of humans, uh, quite a bit less bad to do a whole batch of uh, mice dying. Um, but the, the question is, um, well, when we start changing the genetics of the mice, which is slightly different to the, the pig, which is a chimera with different cells, um, how genetically similar do we have to get before we consider it a human. And you can imagine us wanting to go a lot further than we already have in order to get more advancements, but then you rub up against that uh, ethical uh, issue. Who owns this? Well, nobody, sort of. But this guy kind of wants to. He's building an inter interplanetary uh, transport system. We'll take off from Earth, shoot over to Mars, come back again, just bring a whole heap of people, transform Mars. But who can own this? Well, actually, there's an interesting thing called the moon tree, and it might stop him. So it bans altering the environment of celestial bodies and states that you must take measures to pretend, uh, protect against contamination. This, this moon tree is... Uh, it, it stops uh, accidentally, well, he's not allowed to contaminate uh, Mars and, and the moon. Uh, it bans any state from claiming sovereignty over any territory of celestial bodies. So you can't put up a flag and say, this is USA, this is Australia. You also can't say, this is my country, my separate country. Uh, it bans any ownership of extraterrestrial property by any organisation or person unless they are an international governmental organisation. So you can't do private enterprise on those entities either. So that stops much of the uh, development that we could do on Mars. So the, the question here is, will the Martians ever really have freedom? And this issue is addressed in a TV show that I'm getting hooked on at the moment, The Expanse. Uh, just to not spoil too much of it for you, uh, colonized Mars and the asteroid belt, and some people, well, there's Mars and there's Earth and there's the asteroid belt and there's a fight for freedom. And uh, because of the powers that be, there's a bit of unrest. Uh, and this could happen if you have Martians who are born on Mars without the Mars, without a nationality, uh, who need to have their own rights. So basically, in order to avoid this ethical issue, in order to make it so that we can actually explore you know, our, our solar system, we need some space law reform. And we probably also need to do a lot more research on Mars so that we can actually work out if life ever existed on it first before you contaminate it. Okay, well, so brain and computer interfaces and augmentation. So um, this is another topic. What? Uh, we, can, we can talk about lots of things at, at the pub, <laughs> but I'm running out of time as it is. Uh, so the we are getting very close to being able to like connect directly to computers, and that's really awesome. So one of the ways that we can uh, affect our brain is to treat existing ailments. So at the moment, you can use electrostimulation to do things like solve Parkinson's disease. So you uh, put some in, uh, electrodes, implant them in the brain, fire off electricity every so often, and it stops people shaking. Uh, and there are a lot of degenerative diseases which this could be used to treat. You might want to use a brain-computer interface to extend your body. You might want to control things that are not attached to you. And we're already talking about our mind not actually just being in our brain, but we might actually be connected to the outside world through our various devices. So I took this picture from a video game called Halo. Um, you can imagine people getting a, a neural implant 
in their central nervous system in order to control other devices. But should people be able to control any devices or, or have um, the ability to extend uh, infinitely their, their body's power? Uh, and when you have it tightly coupled, how do you control that? Would we want people to walk around with devices like this attached to them? Probably not. So how do we, how do we prevent people from doing the wrong thing when they augment themselves? Yeah, we're so, doing what you mean, right? Yes, we are. Okay. So, we also might want, want to extend our senses. So, we have five plus senses, um, but we might want more. We want, might want to see the world in different ways. One interesting guy that I saw quite some time ago is this guy. He um, is colorblind. Uh, he can see. Uh, but he can't see colours. And what he's got is a implant that lets him hear sound. The, the camera is directed forward and he hears different tones based on uh, what colour is taking up the majority of the screen. So that's a really interesting way to solve that disability. But we could do other things. We could uh, make it so that we could see infrared or ultraviolet. So we could see a, a much greater variety of what the universe is like. Because we actually only see a very tiny bit of it. Um, you might want to be extending your computing power. So you might want to put something in your brain so that you could do some amazing uh, calculations, do some uh, vector calculus or uh, solve some very hard algebra. You might want to put a chip in your brain so that people know that it's you when you're talking because it's got a uh, cryptographically secure algorithm in your head, so that when someone says, hey, is that really you, you just go, well, my number is blah, 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 and then you've done the, the uh, modular arithmetic in your head in order to transmit that, and then people can really know it's you. And that will actually be very important in the future when we have technologies <coughs> that make it so that we can impersonate anyone that we want to. We, I think that we're going to get further and further with cosmetic surgery to the point that people can look like whatever they want. And I think that uh, in some ways is a bad thing, but in some ways is a good thing. Um, but we need to be able to verify that someone is legitimately them, them, because if we don't, then we'll have societal breakdown. No one will be able to trust anyone. We might use it to communicate better with other people. So we can use those brain-computer interfaces to connect directly to the internet and get information from other places around the world very, very quickly. Uh, or talk directly brain to brain. If you're imagining something, you say, ah, oh, I just had this amazing idea and you can communicate it directly. So uh, I've been browsing some memes lately. <laughs> I'm sure you've all seen this one. Um, but this is where we're going, right? Like we started with language and then we developed you know, writing and reading. And then we got the internet, and that sped things up really, really quickly. And the next thing will be a computer interface with the internet connected, where the latency is near zero. You don't have to type anything. You just have to think it. It's very interesting. But in that case, we have to think about the ethics of that. We have to think about how to protect people from being brain hacked, because if it's directly connected to your brain, you have to make sure that it's secure and that people don't get things like a virus that gives people uh, endless uh, nightmares and stuff like that. So we have to think about how to protect people with this system. <laughs> this is an alternative version of this meme, which I think is uh, pretty hilarious with the different levels of pizza. Um, so uh, we, beyond um, uh, computer interfaces, we might want to uh, grow our brain. So imagine not that it's connected to a computer, <coughs> but that you could just have more brain cells. You could just be naturally more smart. Uh, and I think that this one is actually very much more likely to happen in the near future than very detailed computer brain interfaces. Uh, and the reason for that is because you can add neurons and the brain will take on those neurons and use them uh, in the brain for, to, to do interesting things. You'll be able to learn more. You'll be able to process things more quickly. 
But this is all really interesting, and uh, you know, uh, there are a whole heap of issues around what's you? Is the computer you? Does the computer have rights? Uh, if it's an AI, does the AI have rights? Uh, and, and stuff like that. Uh, and, and the fact that we don't really know much about the, the brain and, and what's involved is indicative by this uh, cartoon. So uh, Peter Singer walks downstairs to see what's going on in his basement. It's flooded and he, he finds this monster. Why are you destroying my, my pipes? Well, actually I worked out that it's more fun for me to break your pipes than it is the pain uh, for you to try and fix it. So I love destroying pipes. I'm a utility monster. The play on words being that it's your utility being destroyed. But you can imagine a situation where someone who has a much bigger brain has a much higher capacity for enjoyment. And so when people are saying, that using a utilitarian metric, in order to determine how to allocate resources, it's not straightforward. We don't have this average like, most people are roughly the same smart, smartness, and so therefore people should have roughly the same say in democracy and get roughly the same resources, barring capitalism and interesting things that happen with that. Um, but you, you get to this uh, situation where it's not as straightforward as it used to be. One life might not be worth one life if someone's a lot smarter than another, uh, using a simple utilitarian metric. Once again, I'm not saying that that's the way it is, but traditional methods, <coughs> traditional philosophy of dealing with uh, utilitarian metrics makes this a, an interesting situation. What's more, we don't actually know much about how the brain works and how that utilitarian stuff <laughs> will pan out. So you can do uh, this thing called the corpus uh, uh, callistoni. I didn't actually say that in writing this speech. Anyway, so what they do is they basically cut the brain in half uh, and you can use it to treat epilepsy. People who have epilepsy, cut it down the middle. Um, the brain works pretty much the same way it did before. They pretty much the same person, they remember things, but they end up sometimes with split brain personality, which means that one side of their body makes decisions that the other side disagrees with. And they'll do things like put a speaker on one ear and say, pick up that cut. And the other side of the brain doesn't hear that. And then you ask the person, why didn't you pick up the cut I asked you to? And they said, well, I, I just didn't feel like it. They'll make up an excuse. And so people's recounting of how their experiences work isn't even reliable. So there's this really interesting situation. Anyway, there's a, a great video by CP, CGP Gray, so you should check that out. Um, if you can go even further with this, and you can take out half of someone's brain, especially when they're a kid, you can take out half of their brain, and they will roughly be the same. In fact, many studies have shown that the uh, brain function is roughly equivalent. So that's really interesting. How much does the, uh, the changing of the brain affect the human being that at least is being reported? Very interesting. Okay, the final one on this one is uh, deeper VR experiences. So you can imagine being able to be transported out of the world that you're in right now and be transported into a much more amazing world where anything's possible, either part-time or permanently. If you have a perfect computer brain interface, you can actually replicate all the senses. And I think it might not be a few, for a few hundred years, but I think that that's a possibility. Okay. And about so, three five. Huh? About three five. Impossible. <laughs> so, but one day, we might have this. But it won't be the, the uh, machines that put us there. For some people, they will choose to do it themselves because they think that their virtual reality experience is much more entertaining. Or possibly, in some situations, they might think it's real. So in philosophy, there's a uh, discussion, oh, I'm having trouble counting it now, but about uh, not being able to tell whether you're in a dream or not. So how can you actually tell that your dreams are fake and reality is real? It's very hard, especially if you have the same recurring dream. And the VR experience will allow you to do that at 
at some point, people may lose touch with reality. They spend more time in this. And so we've got to ask ourselves, is this okay? Should we allow people to do that? It's, um, I don't think we've really explored, we've explored the idea, the metaphysics of it, being in a, a, a dream and um, the possibility that it could happen, but I haven't, I don't think we've actually explored whether it's okay. You know, we think that uh, the state should protect people, should they protect people in this state, in this case. Um, further, if you can get a perfect uh, happiness in your VR situation, and all you need to do is pump in the minimum amount of food, you can chop off all of your limbs and just be powering your brain. And so it's a tiny amount of energy that you're using. Maybe, is this morally good? Could we have more intelligences? Could we have uh, a better experience for everyone, less impact on, well, a, a more high probability of surviving into the future by using less resources and reducing existential risk? In some ways, it could be morally good. Once again, don't say that I'm endorsing this as a plan for the future, but this is an interesting argument that people could have around the ethics of brain-computer interfaces. Coming with that brain-computer interface is data. Data, when you're in VR and when you're in that perfect simulation, will rule our lives. Um, but who gets access? Um, mm. I think that data is already kind of ruling our lives quite a lot, and increasingly so. Um, and it's controversial. So you might have seen this article going around a couple of weeks ago. It's about uh, the way that Trump won the election. And there's a, uh, a method that was used, adopted from a scientist, uh, a private company decided to uh, use this method, Cambridge Analytica. And basically, they worked out that if you collect <coughs> around about 70 Facebook likes, you could work out their skin color with 95% accuracy, sexual orientation, 88% accuracy, and whether they're a Democratic or Republican Party voter with 85% of accuracy. Now, that to a lot of people is a bit scary. But interestingly, this is data that they gave out publicly. They know that they're putting on Facebook. Uh, they're doing it willingly. Um, they're sharing it publicly. Um, but sometimes we don't have that given to us uh, willingly, or well, we don't have that taken from us willingly. So with metadata retention, uh, with su the surveillance state, the uh, government is looking at more and more things that we do. And when you have all of your life having some sort of electronic component in it, the government knows everything about you. In fact, in some cases, they might know more about you than you know about yourself. They might be able to predict illnesses that you have. They might uh, be able to predict whether you're on the verge of becoming a shooter or a Labour Party supporter. And that's scary. That's a bit scary. <laughs> So does the government have the right to know everything that we do? And the government will say things like, oh, well, what if there's a terrorist attack? What will you say then? Well, it's interesting, because it could happen, and it could be really bad. But the government, this, I, I've been bringing out this uh, picture for a while. I did this at the VR conference last year. Uh, it's pretty funny, Oculus Rift on the head uh, with a gun in your hand, a uh, VR gun in your hand. Now, uh, I know you will be doing this. When we get more and more virtual reality and augmented reality, you will be doing this. Because I know you're already taking this in there. Most of you are taking this into your toilet, into a private space, and it has a camera and a speaker. And if someone has access to that, they know what you're doing. Um, but if it's not just VR, it's AR, you'll get rid of this and get rid of that. And you'll have sensors implanted in your body and you'll have uh, data being recorded continuously. So, yeah, that, that's the list. You, in virtual reality, local position, eye movement, cameras, microphones, accelerometers, body monitoring, um, augmented reality, GPS, exactly where you are, body monitoring, so that's gonna be inside of you, and your brain. So that's pretty interesting. And now I'm have access to your thoughts. Will brain-computer interfaces lead to thought police? Uh, just quickly. Uh, just to say, uh, actually, Microsoft is already uh, did uh, that uh, augmented reality of the glasses. 
Yeah, so I'm talking about the next step. You don't put it on, you inject it. You get surgery to put it into your eyes. And that will be very, very scary. You might move quickly because I'm um, time up, sort of. So there's this. Some of you know now. Now is biohacker. So now he's a biohacker, or there are biohackers. And they do a really good job, and they do things like uh, work out ways to better diagnose people with STDs. But um, later, they could be biocrackers. They could be the black hat equivalent of the biohacking world. And in the same way that in the early days, when people made computer viruses, they sent around a virus which said, aha, your network is unlocked, I can get access to your computer. And later on, they used it for things like getting access to secret files and getting access to money and stealing your identity. So what we're actually assuming right now is safety and stupidity. So what most people who want to do massive harm uh, rely on ideologies that require illogical reasoning. So there's some sort of logical gap, which is like, I think the world works this way, and therefore I should kill myself and all the people around me because I'm gonna end up you know, a hero or, or in heaven or stuff like that. So we generally think that those people might not be great at science and engineering or have access to resources. Um, and ooh, the cost and accessibility of doing things like creating a new virus to wipe out humanity is extraordinarily high. But that's increasingly less the case. So cost per genome. When we first got started, it was a few billion to sequence the human genome. And from that point onwards, uh, I'm missing a couple of years here, anyway, uh, it's getting really, really cheap. And we're talking about USB-based uh, genome sequences and home-based CRISPR kits. And the ability of us to actually work out what that evil thing is, what is the protein fold that we need in order to kill all of humanity is going down by a lot. So that goes away. That, that ability to police that that way goes away. So should we ban biohacking? I don't think so, because the genie is our important. You can't actually stop gene sequencing from being cheap. You can't stop computer power from being cheap. So what I think will probably happen is a bioarms race, where what we're doing is actively fighting engineered infections. Every day, we're actively seeking out genetic material that's in our environment, hermetically sealing ourselves in to protect ourselves. I think that this is a real scary possibility. Genetic engineering could save our lives, could make us live forever, but in the wrong hands, with enough time and enough computing power, it could do a lot of harm. Um, very quickly, sorry. Um, Turing test, AI. Um, this guy is Vsauce, and he has a great channel, and you should check him out if you're into this stuff. I'm sure you have already. Uh, so AI, one day, according to some people, could be conscious, could actually have feelings, and then morally, it matters what we do to them. And the standard that we have right now is, do we have, can we have a conversation with that machine and work out whether they're a real person or not? Uh, so Cleverbot says yes. Uh, and what Vsauce did is they took Cleverbot and they lined it up on a dating game show and took real people in and got them to ask uh, typed in answers. And they said, we're not gonna let you hear the person because we wanna make sure that uh, you're not judging based on the sound of their voice, just on their opinions. And they went through and this woman said that she liked the clever boy. Because <laughs> although the answers were a bit off, she thought, he was kind of zany. He's a bit quirky. It will be very hard at some point to work out whether an AI is, an, is a human being or not, whether an intelligence is an AI or a human being. And I think it will actually matter much sooner than, be, than when we get to general intelligence because uh, it's very easy to replicate speech uh, and to put meat on top of a machine and to... Uh, come up with intelligent sounding questions. And so I think this is going to matter. So the moral question is, how do we treat entities that seem intelligent, but you can't tell if they are without opening them up? Anyways, so uh, that's the end of my talk. I hope you enjoyed it.